So in this video, we're going to talk about the third attribute of the church, Catholic. Just to remind you, we're going through the four attributes from the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed, one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. Now, Catholic. This one can cause a little bit of misunderstanding. It's a little more difficult than one and holy, where I could pull up a bunch of different Bible passages that include those words. Catholic is not a word we find much in the Bible, but I hope by the end of this video to convince you that it's an idea we find a lot in the Bible. The first confusion we have to address is when we say Catholic, we don't mean Roman Catholic. Catholic is a term, as we can see by its inclusion in this creed, that was used early in the church's history and very broadly, and was not restricted just to Roman Catholics. The basic meaning of the word Catholic is universal. So, when the Roman Catholic Church puts Catholic in their name, they are claiming, we are the universal church. If you are not under the Bishop of Rome, you are not in the church. Now, in the last hundred years, they may have gotten a little bit more lax about whether or not you can be saved without being in the Roman Catholic Church, but the basic claim is still there. The Roman Catholic Church equals the Church. That's why they put Catholic in the name, because the Roman Catholic Church just is the Catholic or Universal Church. As Presbyterians, we do not believe that the Presbyterian Church is the Catholic Church. We believe that the Catholic Church is much bigger than just Presbyterians. It includes Lutherans and Baptists and many other denominations of Christians. The question that arises from that, of course, is, well, okay, if the Catholic Church, the universal church, is not identical to one denomination, how do you tell which churches are true churches and which churches are false churches? But that's a question we'll get to in a later class. For now, I want to take this word Catholic and try to understand what it means and try to see what sorts of biblical themes it captures. I'm going to start with a quote from Cyril of Jerusalem's Catechetical Lecture. It, that is the church, is called Catholic then because it extends over all the world, from one end of the earth to the other, and because it teaches universally and completely one and all the doctrines which ought to come to man's knowledge, concerning things both visible and invisible, heavenly and earthly, and because it brings into subjection to godliness the whole race of mankind, governors and governed, learned and unlearned, and because it universally treats and heals the whole class of sins, which are committed by soul or body, and possesses in itself every form of virtue which is named, both in deeds and words, and in every kind of spiritual gifts. Okay, so from that quote, you can see that this is a big concept. The term Catholic includes a lot. I went through and tried to find some of the different sorts of Catholicity discussed in this quote. First is the Catholicity of geography or nationality. The Catholic Church extends over the whole world, crossing national boundaries. There is also a Catholicity of ethnicity. People of all different ethnicities are united within the Catholic Church. There is a Catholicity of type of person. That includes social class, governors and governed. It includes particularly learned people and unlearned people, every kind of person is included in the church. There's also a Catholicity of doctrine. Uh, it includes the whole sphere of Christian doctrine. And uh, this is co could be contrasted with two different things. One would be heresy, which is where you divide from the church over a false doctrine. But it also contrasts with a sort of myopia that just focuses on a, on a true doctrine, but to the exclusion of focus on other things. A Catholicity of doctrine sees the whole breadth of biblical teaching. Then there's also a Catholicity of virtue, the idea that the church treats every kind of sin, and that in the church we develop every kind of virtue, not just one or two. And finally, there's a Catholicity of gifting. The church has all the spiritual gifts. So the basic idea from all of these is wholeness or universality. But we can see that there's a lot of different kinds of universality discussed here. I don't know that I'm going to be able to trace all of them down with biblical citations in just this video, but uh, I want to look at a couple of them. So let's turn to biblical passages. 
Deuteronomy 31, 10 to 13. And Moses commanded them, At the end of every seven years, at the set time in the year of release, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, and little ones, and the sojourner within your towns, that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, and be careful to do all the words of this law, and that their children, who have not known it, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, as long as you live in the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. So I, I picked this passage especially because of the word assemble. In Hebrew, that's the verb kahal, and it has a noun form, kahal, which is an assembly. This is an important word because it's the word for church. That might surprise you, but let, let me explain. Uh, this Hebrew word kahal in the Greek translation of the Old Testament is translated with the Greek word ekklesia. And that Greek word ekklesia is the word that Jesus uses and the disciples use to refer to the church. It's actually the word translated church in your English Bible. If you pick up an English Bible, you might think that the church is purely a New Testament affair because you don't see the word church once in your Old Testament. But as a matter of fact, for early Christians reading the Bible in Greek, they could see that the church was all over the Old Testament. In the assembly of people that gathered before Mount Sinai and heard the law, and in the assembly of the people that gathered around the tabernacle and then continued to come to Jerusalem and gather at the temple at various festivals. When the Old Testament talks about this assembly, it very often emphasizes the theme of all Israel, that the ideal is that this assembly would not just be one tribe or group of, among Israel, but that it would unite the whole people, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, all the different tribes. And then you can see here as well, men, women, and little ones. So we have diversity of sex and we have diversity of age. Even the little children are, are present. We have class diversity. It's not just the landed inhabitants, but also the sojourners who are to come. All of these people are to come. In this case, uh, to come and hear the words of the law read to them. So I think we start to see the beginnings of the theme of Catholicity here, the ideal of all Israel. Here it's not universal in the sense of every nation, but in the sense of the whole people of Israel gathered together. That's one strand we could pick out, and we could follow that strand through the whole Old Testament. But here's, here's another strand, Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country, and your kindred, and your father's house, to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Here we have God's first words to Abraham. And we see right here, right at the beginning, that already the plan is for more than just Abraham's family. It's bigger than just Israel. God says, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So although we have this focus on Israel as God's chosen people throughout the Old Testament, there's this plan that God's blessing is going to go through Israel and extend out to all the other nations as well. Another example we could pick of this theme is Isaiah 2, verses 1 to 4. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So here we have this theme again. 
in among all these other prophecies in Isaiah about the restoration of Israel to the land after God has judged them, about God bringing them back from exile, we also find a hope not just for Israel, but for the other nations. Isaiah says that in the latter days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the highest of the mountains. Now, uh, the temple was on a mountain, Mount Zion in Jerusalem, but it's not a particularly high mountain. There are many other mountains around it that are taller. But the prophecy says that this mountain is going to be lifted up as the highest of the mountains, and the nations are going to flow to it and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. Why? So that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. Because, as it goes on to say, out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So the picture here is that God's word is going to go out from Jerusalem into all the nations, and it's going to gather them back and bring them to his temple. And it's going to lead to this age of unprecedented peace when people beat their swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks and people stop practicing war, bringing harmony to the whole world. So again, we see that this ultimate plan is not just for Israel alone, but to bring all the nations into obedience to God. Okay, we could pick other passages from the Old Testament, but let's jump to the New Testament here. John 3. 16 to 17, probably a verse many of you know well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. I bring up this verse just to make the point, what is the purpose of salvation according to this What is God's purpose in sending Jesus? Is it just for Israel? No, it's the whole world. There is a universality to this plan of salvation that encompasses the whole world. Some other texts that highlight this theme. Mark 16, 15. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. So this is an interesting way to phrase it. He doesn't just say proclaim the gospel to all different types of people, but proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. By the way, if you've ever heard the story of Francis of Assisi preaching to the birds, you know, this is the proof text for that. It just says preach to the whole creation, so he preached to the birds. I'm not sure I'd apply the passage quite that way, but the general idea is sound. God's plan of salvation is to recreate the entire world, to redeem creation in its entirety. This theme means the inclusion of the Gentiles, these other nations. And I think that was a difficult thing for Jesus' first disciples to grasp. You can kind of see as you go through the book of Acts, it takes a long time for all the pieces to come into place as to the fact that the nations are going to be included. It starts in Acts 1, verses 6 to 8. Uh, This is Jesus meeting with his disciples after his resurrection. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Notice that question. What does it say about how the disciples are thinking about what Jesus came to do? Of course, that must have been somewhat shaken up by his death and resurrection. That was never something that they expected to happen. But now they think, okay, Jesus has risen from the dead. Time to kick out the Romans and get Israel set up as an earthly nation. But how does Jesus respond? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So notice, after they receive power at Pentecost, the plan is that witnesses to Christ will go into Jerusalem, but then to Judea, the territory surrounding Jerusalem, then north to Samaria. The Samaritans and the Jews may have had their differences, but the Samaritans at least claimed an Israelite heritage, then beyond Samaria to the very ends of the earth. Now, there's clearly this picture of the gospel going out to the whole world here, 
But I'm not sure that those disciples who were there really understood what Jesus was talking about. I, I think maybe they thought, well, yeah, there are Jews throughout the entire world, so we're going to have to go to the entire world. The reason I think that is, as we go through the book of Acts, we see that it still takes them a while to figure it out. My next text comes from the story of Peter and Cornelius. And it, this is that story that has the sheet that's lowered down from heaven, and Peter sees all of these unclean animals, and God tells him, get up and eat. And he says, I can't do that. I can't break the clean laws. But God tells him to do it anyway. And the moral of the story is that now that Christ has come, the thing that these food laws represented, this separation between Jew and Gentile, is going to be done away with. And here's how Peter put himself put the moral of the story. He said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. What a big lesson. The previous practice has been for Jews to remain separate because they're a separate holy nation. But now, Peter says, we should no longer call any person common or unclean because God's gospel is going out to all of them. That's actually not the last crisis in the book of Acts that surrounds Gentiles being brought in. Uh, but for the sake of time, I'm going to skip to Ephesians here. Ephesians 2, 14 to 16. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So Paul, talking about the conflict between Jews and Gentiles here, uh, says that Jesus has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. So Christ, in his body, dying on the cross, has broken down these fundamental divisions between Jew and Gentile by abolishing the law in order to create in himself one new man in place of the two. So in Jesus' death on the cross, these two separate people have been brought together, reconciled to each other, and not just reconciled to each other, but to God. And perhaps because they're reconciled to God. So here, as going back to the theme of oneness, as they are united to God, they're also united to each other. And through Christ's death on the cross, the hostility between them is killed. So the point here is that now in Christ, through his death, the divisions between these different ethnicities has been broken down. And they are united. So here we have this theme of Catholicity, in the sense of a Catholicity of ethnicity and nationality, that people of every different nation and ethnicity are going to be reconciled to each other through Christ. But it's not just restricted to ethnic divisions, it actually extends to other fundamental human divisions. Take a look at Galatians 3, 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, based on what Paul says elsewhere, I don't think he means to annihilate ethnic distinctions or annihilate the difference between male and female, uh, as if these were not important aspects of who we are as humans. But the point here is that they are no longer going to be sources of division. Jew and Greek, slave and free, male and female are now one in Christ Jesus. They are united. And so through Christ's reconciling power, this broadness, this Catholicity, extending over all of these natural human divisions is manifested in the church. Let's take a look at 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9 for a slightly different angle on this. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Here this Catholicity is specifically expressed in terms of suffering. The suffering of Peter's hearers is not something they are undergoing alone. It's actually something that connects them to the whole church. This suffering is being experienced by their brotherhood throughout the world. 
it's a similar metaphor to what Paul talks about. If something happens to one of the members of the body, it happens to the whole body. And so even our suffering is a sign of our universal Catholic unity. One last passage. This one from the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 7, verses 7 through 10. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. So John in Revelation hears this command to seal the servants of God on their foreheads. Where is that reference from? Well, it's from Ezekiel 9. In Ezekiel, Ezekiel has this image when God has said he's going to destroy Jerusalem. He sees these seven men. So six of them are guys with clubs who are there to destroy the city. But one of them is a scribe who is to pass through the city and mark with the sign of an X on the forehead everybody who sighs and groans over the abominations that are committed in the city. It is perhaps noteworthy that we don't actually hear whether or not he found anyone in the city who fit that description. But here, 144,000 are found. Now, there are some who take this as the literal number, but since it is 12 times 12 times 1,000, and 12 is the number of God's people, it seems quite likely that we have a symbolic number here. 12,000 from each tribe, 12 tribes. So we have this picture of the completeness of God's people, um, bringing through these Old Testament themes of all Israel uh, numbered and standing together. That's what John hears. Then he looks, and what does he see? A great multitude, not just 144,000, but nobody can number it, and they are from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. So different Christians will interpret this passage differently. Some commentators, though, will remark that when John hears something and then sees it, very often this hearing and seeing are two different perspectives on the same reality. And that's how I interpret this passage. We have the people of Israel, 12 tribes, the fullness of the people that God has numbered out to the last one. But that people of Israel just is this great multitude from every nation. As it turns out, God's plan for Israel is ultimately to include a great multitude from every nation. In other words, the theme of all Israel from the Old Testament maps onto the theme of the church from every nation and tribe and people and language. And so here we find again that Catholicity expressed that redemption in Christ is not just for ethnic Israel, but extends to include every nation, every tribe, people, and language. The Catholicity of the church embracing every different nation and ethnicity.